Colin, uh, colleague Justin Clark from Australia. So I will introduce both of them in more detail in a second. Um, but yeah, I'd like to start us off with setting the scene for the next hour. So um, as Steve just mentioned, um, there's an increasing demand from stakeholders for high quality re reviews, such as um, systematic reviews, guidelines, and HTA reports. And these evidence syntheses need to be delivered faster, with greater efficiency, and at lower cost. So there's also a societal need for high quality, understandable, and accessible information. And to improve um, speed and quality, methodological innovation and uh, automation tools have emerged to support many steps uh, in the systematic review process. So how are these tools best developed? And what role does the collaboration between information specialists and IT developers play? What are the lessons learned of evidence synthesis professionals that have developed and introduced automation tools at their institutions? So at the beginning of this keynote, Ashley and Justin will both give a presentation about their approaches. Then we will discuss some questions arising from their talks. And finally, I will invite the audience to um, ask questions to our speakers. So, our first speaker is Ashley Lee Muller. She's a senior researcher at the Norwegian Institute of Public Health, where she leads the machine learning team in the Division of Health Services. Her career began in social policy consulting in Boston, USA, and she now provides research and technical consultation on evidence synthesis on the European level. She's interested in the intersection, and I found that especially interesting, of decolonization with evidence-based medicine and policy for marginalized population and the role of machine learning in this intersection. <laughs> Our second speaker is Justin Clark. He's a senior research information specialist at the Institute for Evidence-Based Healthcare at Bond University in Australia. He's also the information specialist for the Cochrane Acute Respiratory Infections Group and the search co-lead of the Living Evidence Network. He's one of the inventors of the two weeks systematic review method. <laughs> I've never done that. Uh, <laughs> a founding member of the International Collaboration for the Automation of Systematic Reviews, and he currently heads up the automation team at his institute. And in his work, he focuses on retrieving information to minimize resources in the conduct of systematic re uh, reviews, and he also develops tools and methods for systematic review automation. So, I'd now... <laughs> I'd now like to invite Leigh to start with her input. Please. Hi, hello. <laughs> oh, it's great to be here. It's really great. This is the first time I've left Norway in three years, which makes me very happy. Um, when I get happy, I start to talk faster. <laughs> Also, when I'm talking about something that I like and when I'm talking to people who I think are interesting, so lots of excuses. If, if I start talking too fast, raise your finger. Okay, it happens all the time. It, I would much prefer to see a bunch of reminders then that you can't understand me, okay? But I'll do my best. So, why do we use machine learning in evidence synthesis, in health technology assessments, in the work we do to support guideline makers? Why? Why is it interesting and exciting? Why is it important? I'm going to call on someone on my team if no one gives an answer. <laughs> huh? Jose? Mm -hmm. Why else? Yeah, to be faster, to speed things up, to, to help us do our jobs better, right? 
to help to help maximize, I think, what James Thomas once called the scarce and valuable resource that is us, our time, our skill. Machine learning should be a support. Um, it should be a tool that we use. Not blindly, right? Not without attention to bias, to our own bias, to algorithmic bias, but it should be a support. And yet, I'm going to argue that despite that very positive <laughs> introduction, I think we should see machine learning as a disruptive innovation in our field. So I'll try to get you on board with that idea. Um, and then I'll talk about why I think, what it requires of us, and then who then is required. So quick definition, a suggested definition. It's very hard to define machine learning without saying the word machine is learning. But machine learning is math, right? The use of advanced maths to, to analyze, to adapt to data without following explicit instructions. Is, is, there, is that an awful definition? Is there anyone who can correct that? OK, that's an OK working definition, I hope. <laughs> but um, I'm highlighting this part in green because analyzing and adapting and learning, those are things that I think we associate as human things to do, right? Humans learn. We go to school and we learn. Um, and we, are, you know, we consciously adapt to our environment. So we're talking about computer systems that are doing something human-like without needing us, necessarily. And I have an asterisk here. Asterisk? Asterisk? Asterisk, asterisk here. Because humans are needed at all points of the process, but just in different spots than maybe we expected, in different spots that we expect to be, to be relevant and to be there. So I think thinking about machine learning as something disruptive is helpful because it really means different roles for humans. It means we're not maybe where we think we should be. And we call something disruptive if it, if it significantly changes a process or a product in a way that, that the market, to use kind of a business word term, doesn't, under, doesn't expect in a way that users didn't want, maybe um, in a way that users don't necessarily think it attractive or think it necessary, right? That's a disruptive part. And I think it's helpful to think about machine learning as an innovation, not necessarily technology. I don't think it's, I don't think for us it's a specific algorithm that's, that's disruptive. Uh, I don't think it's the, the, the technology. I think it's the, the way that machine learning f um, fits into or disrupts an entire kind of process, our entire infrastructure of, of, of the evidence synthesis. The way it changes the human machine relationship and changes our roles in what we normally do. And I think it can, right? Machine learning can change how we write reviews. It changes how, off, how quickly we can get them done. It changes um, our roles within teams. At our institution, it changes our roles of management, actually, because now we're doing things that our managers, who are methods experts, don't know. Do they trust us or not? So the benefits, then, to kind of leaning in <laughs> to that machine learning is disruptive is that we can't, we shouldn't assume it's going to be adopted. I don't think we should assume that it'll just happen over time. It'll, you know, it'll be diffused. And then it forces us to then recognize that disruptiveness, right? Recognize disruption. It's, it changes scary and it's hard. And, it, and we have to then, what, you know, what does it mean for us? And it makes it incumbent upon us to figure out, I wrote employees to kind of be broad, but to figure out how we make ourselves and each other feel safe and feel valued in our jobs, in our positions, in our roles as for whatever roles these are, information specialists or reviewers or commissioners or users. So that's why I think it's a helpful framework. Then what's required of us as, again, HTA bodies, other systematic, evident, um, systematic review bodies, I think overall it requires us to have more of an innovation mindset maybe than we're used to. I think it requires us on the organizational level to be willing to challenge <laughs> how we do things now, to be willing to challenge the status quo, as Steve, Steve had a slide that was, we need to be doing things differently. That, I think, is really it's an important st place to start. I think it requires us to accept some risk, meaning we try things and they don't work. You know, innovation is very ineffective, right? It's not going to always work. It's not going to always do what we want it to do. And it has to be OK as long as we can figure out how to learn and how to learn from what isn't working and what's working and when to keep going and when to maybe try something else. So maybe these are just normal principles of kind of continuous, continual learning organizations. I think it requires us to build an infrastructure to do this then. So in our institution, we have a dedicated team. 
um, which I lead, which I'll try not, I'm very proud of them, but I'll try not to talk about them so much. But it doesn't have to be a team, it could be something else, but that's how we've organized ourselves. And I think it requires some sort of commitment to a larger vision or to a large, you know, to other values, and maybe we can lean on, maybe we can lean on our organization's values, or maybe we might need something a little bit more specific, kind of a reminder of why we're doing this difficult, challenging, conf conf confrontational thing. So a question for later maybe then is how, how much of these activities are kind of usual where we work? Yeah, I don't know. Okay, so who is required for implementation? Like I said, I won't talk about our team because at three o'clock we're gonna talk about our team a lot. <laughs> um, and actually I'll try to talk about people who aren't usually involved in evidence synthesis or don't, don't have to be involved in evidence synthesis. Um, I think a big part of kind of innovation-oriented thinking is, is involving much more heterogeneous actors than usual. So I'll draw on my experience. I've talked a little bit broader now, but now I'll kind of, I'll use my experience here in this slide, and I'll, I'll try to kind of sketch out the constellation of, of people or actors who have made our implementation activities successful. So I won't talk about kind of the relationships between these groups or conditions for success or kind of how much or how little they should be involved, but but just kind of name them and give some examples. And it sounds, uh, it sounds a bit cliche, but I think the name of the game is really diversity here, right? And drawing, drawing from the very smart and very capable and very skilled people we already have at organizations, or at least in our networks, definitely in our networks, right? Um, and again, try to focus on people outside of evidence synthesis, mainly. Okay, the first one, software developers. Won't actually talk about them that much because Justin will, rep you know, will talk about their input. But one important thing I want to say is that they, they can really lower the threshold of using something disruptive. So I think they can make something that's disruptive, maybe not necessarily so disruptive, by, giving, by having a focus on user design, user experience. If you're an organization like us, it's not lucky enough to have software people. Um, we have IT people. Is Truk here from our team? No. I thought he would come. We have, <laughs> we have IT people. We have IT people in our organization, and they kind of have the opposite role, actually, as our software providers. Um, we have, you know, we have forward-facing software. It's great. It's user-friendly. It's pretty. Um, but we have someone in IT who can build us a shiny app in R to do kind of the same things. And it's not pretty, and it's not user-friendly. We're not going to use it. But it's really pulled back the curtain for us as a team of non-specialists. So I think IT resources that we already have can really demystify some of these things, right? I also have qualitative researchers here, which is kind of fun. Not qualitative reviewers, but qualitative researchers. Um, they have been an unexpectedly important, um, in Norwegian you say sparring partner, but you mean it in, in conversations, not fighting. <laughs> um, because they're used to having to build trust with their research subjects. They're used to having to build trust with their readers. So they, their recognition that they are a non-objective part of the research process it helps me to, to, to has it been a reminder that we are non-objective parts of our research, of our research process. And machine learning, to some extent, magnifies that. Ooh, hi. yeah. Okay, this fourth group I'm calling geneticists and biobankers. Our institute manages quite a few biobanks. Um, I have a lot of very smart geneticists and epigeneticists. And this group represents people for whom machine learning is not disruptive at all, it's, it's this completely normal tool, not normal, but completely necessary tool to handle their data. And it's, it's like a breath of fresh air <laughs> to talk to them regularly. To, so to remind our, myself that we could, we could have a goal that machine learning is just a tool. It's nothing threatening, it's just what we do, right? And they really bring experience with data management, with infrastructure, which with, they, they know that they have to hire people who can keep up with kind of new, with new advances. They have experience outsourcing machine learning activities versus you know, upskilling people. And they reflect all, all of the time, actually, on kind of biases and using AI generally in healthcare, maybe not just machine learning. A fifth group that I think is an important implementation expert or implementation player is yeah, what I'm calling change management experts, for lack of a better term. These are people who have said, you need to get certified in PRINCE2. You need to know what you're talking about. In terms of project management, you need to be approaching this as something different than a review, different than a research team. They, people who have the vocabulary outside of research to talk about high-performing, small but high-performing teams, right? Um, scaling up, 
innovation infrastructure. So this team has really enabled us, I think, to think about machine learning as something that's... To, this, this group has enabled us to, to be something beyond just a review team that we normally otherwise would have been, and I think would have been totally satisfactory, but not as effective. Okay, and the last group here, um, I'm calling them machine learning in evidence, and this is experts, and this is to give credit where credit is due here. I'm very proud of our team, but the only reason why we exist, the only reason is because in late April uh, 2020, James Thomas called me and gave me a half an hour description of why and how you build a training set and a testing set for Classifier. And that was what I needed. Like, I was not getting it. I was not going to get over the hump. So it's the people in this room who've done the work. That's the reason why I can sit up here and talk about you know, implementation and scaling up. So thank you to the experts here, honestly. Um, I think maybe 10% of you are the first authors of our, our machine learning syllabus. So just to give, yeah, like I said, we're not building, we haven't built anything up from the ground up. We're really, we are working because there's people who have done a lot, a lot of work in this field. So to give credit, thank you, James, and thank you for all of you for, uh, who I met recently in evidence synthesis or in machine learning here. That, I think, was the last slide. Do I have any more time? Or? No? Okay. Then maybe we can spend the, the, the question session talking about these. Um, I have some ideas about how we can be really using this framework. Um, I'll hand it off to you then, Justin. Oh, okay. Thank you, Leigh. Very interesting talk. <laughs> oh, <coughs> Hello. Uh, so I'm Justin. I'm from Australia. Um, I met a few of you, I think. Some of you were at the I Caesar. Icaziza meeting, <laughs> I think, maybe. We're trying to work out how to pronounce it properly. Um, I just want to start by kind of reiterating what some other people have said. It's so nice to actually be out and about. And I really appreciate the invite from Pickwig to come and present today. It looks like a great session. And I appreciate it so much, I'm not going to do this one in my pajamas, I think. I'll actually put on my jacket. So. If you're wondering what that joke's about, you might find out if you ask some people. <laughs> so um, I'm going to talk about our tools first, then the importance of, of forming a strong collaborative relationship uh, with the guys who build the tools, and maybe how to do that, or how we've done that, I should say. First things first, I'm going to work out make sure the clicker works. Yes. So these two, uh, these two. So I think Mary int introduced me as head of automation team. That's pretty much me and these two. So it sounds much more impressive than it actually is. So myself, and that's Dr. Matt Carter. He's a doctor in computer science. Connor Forbes. He's got a bachelor's now in computer science, um, doing his honours year now in computer science. So the three of us pretty much build all the tools. So everything I'm going to show you today has been built by us three. Myself and Matt have been working together since 2016. Connor came on board in 2019. Very fortunate, very, very talented young man um, who keeps trying to get poached by all the other universities. So we've got to try to hang on to him somehow. So when we set out to start to think about how to build tools, what tools to build, how can we do it, uh, there was only me and Matt at that point. So we didn't have a lot of money, not a lot of resources. I think Matt was working two days a week. I was allocated about a day, two days a week as well to work on the program. So what we did is we went through and we broke a systematic review up into as many, and those of you who saw my talk yesterday, sorry, it's not the, all the same just the first couple of slides. Um, so we broke it up as much as we could into as many component steps as we could. I think we're at 31 now. What this let us do is it let us pick the ones that we hated the most so we could try to automate them as much as we could. Um, and I'm kind of joking, but also not joking, because it's really a systematic review requires a lot of skill, knowledge, expertise, 
and a lot of them is a lot of what you do is quite fun and interesting, and you learn a lot of things. But there's also a lot of boring, painful tasks in there as well that you have to do. So we try to focus on those boring, painful tasks, which leads me to this slide. So these currently are all of the steps or tasks in a review where either we've built a tool or we're using someone else's tool. Um, so I think you'll see EndNote is still in there, for instance. So we still use EndNote as our core reference management system. Uh, we swiped Robot Search, which is a really neat tool. Uh, Robot Reviewer also we use, which is not ours. I'd just like to point them out. Uh, most of the rest I think we built ourselves or in collaboration with other people. So I'm just going to have a little slide on each tool. Hopefully it will take three minutes. Maria Inti, yep, perfect. All right, so, oh, and here's our web platform, our website. Everything's free, by the way. Everything's freely available if you have the internet. The internet's not free, of course, but, you know, if you've got the internet, you're fine. You can use our tools. We plan to keep it free for as long as we can. I think at the moment we have enough funding to keep the servers running for free for two years. We assume we'd be able to get more money to keep it free. So that's kind of our plan. Um, yeah, to keep it free, really, because uh, we like people using it, basically. And that's another really important factor, I think, when you're building tools, which I haven't actually put in my slides. It's really nice when you get all that work and a bunch of people use them. It's very, very satisfying. I try not to sit there looking at my Google Analytics scores and hitting F5 every day. I don't succeed always. Um, but this is probably... The most important take-home message I always try to get people to pay attention to, and they never do. Um, we build our tools with this idea that you actually need skills, talented people to do good reviews or good evidence synthesis or HCAs. Um, we don't want to remove the need for skills in any of our tools. All our tools have been designed with this idea that skilled people can use them to do their jobs quicker and more efficiently. Um, primarily, that's because I don't want to do myself out of a job, by the way, because, you know, I like being paid. So first of all, Methods Wizard. Um, so the Methods Wizard is a tool to help you write a protocol. So I'm going to spend far, three, no, two and a half more minutes probably on this. Um, if you are interested in all these tools, I will be running a workshop, I think, tomorrow afternoon, uh, where I'll live demo all the tools and show you how they all work properly. So I'm just going to quickly talk about them. So this is a protocol writing tool. You answer a bunch of questions about your review, put it into the uh, methods wizard. It spits out a protocol for you. So we've written a bunch of random sentences uh, from our own methods that it will draw upon, and it will just write your method section for you. Only in English. So I was thinking about that today, and I thought, we only do English. So if any Germans want to translate the whole computer code for us, OK. Uh, we don't have any more money, though, so you'd have to do it on a volunteer basis. Uh, word frequency analyzer. So now I'm just going to talk about searching. We actually started search with our searching tools because I was you know, doing most of the work, so I thought I might as well start with searching, which is my primary job. Uh, so we have a tool to do text mining. You upload some references, and it will just count the number of times words appear, nothing fancy. Uh, then, oh, yeah, and there's a sort of highlight. So nothing fancy. Just counts words. That's it. Uh, we have our search refiner or search refinery. Neat tool we did with the University of Queensland. Um, so you kind of it visualizes your search for you. You can figure out which bits you don't perform very well. Take those bits out, and by bits I mean search words or mesh terms, uh, to refine your search so you screen a lot less. Uh, and that's it in action. Kind of nice looking octopus tool. Very neat. Uh, Polyglot Search Translator, which was my first tool that I built. Um, still our most used and most famous tool. I think we have over 1,000 users a month come and do a polyglot search. It will take a PubMed or Ovid search and, well, it's a lot more than that now. I think we might have 14 databases that will translate your search strategy into. Uh, we have a deduplicator. So deduplication, obviously, one of the most awful jobs ever in the history of systematic reviews. Uh, so late last year, we launched a deduplicator. Uh, it's pretty good. I think I'm talking about that and our results of how it works a little bit, a little bit later this afternoon. 
Um, also, part of deduplication when you do a search or a review, sometimes you've got to update your search. It sucks when you have to rescreen all the old results. So you can actually get it to take out any results you've previously screened. Uh, Screenatron is our screening tool, sort of basic standard screening tool. If you use Rayan, Covidence, or any of the other 200 that exist, very similar. Uh, it'll do keyword mapping, highlighting, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we have a dispute tool, so if you do your um, dispute resolutions, you can either upload EndNote, XMLs, or from the Screenatron. It will just tell you where you disagree. But very nicely, it will also give you your Kappa coefficient score and other things. Um, our statistician had a lot of fun. We had to stop him putting more stats in, by the way. He got so excited. Uh, spider site tool, this is quite new. I think this was our most recent one. Uh, this will just automatically pull the citing articles and cited articles from a bunch of references. So you upload five references, and you'll see it'll get all the cited ones and citing ones as well. And then finally, I think, RevMan Replicant. So if you do your review in RevMan 5, uh, you can upload the RevMan file, and it will write the results section from the forest plots from that RevMan file. Once again, we got a whole bunch of different sentences. This was based on Clive Adams from the Schizophrenia Group gave us this, um, and we converted it into an online format. All right, how much longer? Oh, good, great. All right, so I'll keep going until 2.30. I'm kidding. No, I'm kidding. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so ways we collaborate. So and I think this is really important. So um, we have a small, tight-knit team or crew. Uh, we actually all hang out on the weekends, and we get uh, drink beer together. That's not compulsory. You don't have to collaborate in that, although that is one of the funner bits. But so for instance, uh, so Matt. I think, um, so Matt's actually come to a lot of systematic, has attended and been a part of, as a participant, um, our systematic review workshops, for instance. I think we run one or two a year. So he's come on and he's actually learned how to do a systematic review. He learned so well, he went, oh my god, I hate that, I'm never doing one. But in theory, he knows how to do them. We also co-author research publications together. So this is kind of a way to, to work together and collaborate and to form a kind of relationship where they're a bit more invested in how to build the tools and how to help out with the reviews. Nothing like getting your name on a paper, really, to, to get you moving. Connor, very similar, although he got so keen, he actually did do a review. So I can't remember what it was on, but um, masks, maybe. So he actually now has co-authored a systematic review. So as well as being a computer scientist, technically he's now an actual systematic reviewer. Um, so that sort of collaboration, and I think that, that enthusiasm from those two to be a part of systematic reviews and learn about them has really helped uh, with a lot of our user design and, and why I think we have quite a good uptake on tool usage. And then me, and I was thinking about this on the way over. So anyone wondering, that is, yes, the same shirt that I'm wearing now. <laughs> I thought about that, I was, oh my god, halfway here between the hotel and the institute, or Ickwig. I didn't have time to go back and change my shirt. So it's very embarrassing, so I thought I'd just point that out. Um, so me, what have I done? So I've gone the other way. I've learned how to do a tiny bit of JavaScripting, um, a little bit. What that actually lets me do is I can actually do some of the really easy coding updates, the stuff you don't need any talent or skill really to do. Um, that allows them to focus on the hard, complicated stuff. Um, but it also you know, shows them that I'm also interested in learning their skills and, and helping them while they're learning our skills and, and helping us. And I think that might be it. Yeah, so that's kind of how we collaborate. And this is just a quick shot of our production model. We always start out with this idea of um, we're really building the tools for us. We're, we do a lot of reviews, 30 or 35 a year, I think. So we start off with this idea of, well, we're just going to build a tool for us to use internally at our institute. Uh, we then, of course, release it in the institute as an alpha version. Uh, we then have a session and a feedback session with all the reviewers. I think we have 10, uh, anyway, a lot of research fellows. We get together over lunch or something and talk about what's good, what sucks, how to fix it, uh, what else we need to do. Then we create a beta version, uh, release that out in the wild, I guess, to everyone. 
but we make sure everyone knows it's a beta version. Uh, and then we take all the feedback we then get from the international community very seriously, and, and we actively feed that into then a um, update of that beta version to a production version. So all of you who've emailed me over the last couple of years saying your tool is great, but it would be better if it did this, hopefully you'll see most of your um, ideas implemented. And, and it is actually user feedback from our users that makes them, I think, uh, really good. So those of you on the is it the expert information retrieval message board email group, would have seen we sent out some stuff about the deduplicator late last year, for instance. And I'm not sure if anyone's in the room who, who provided feedback on that, but we actually had some four or five very active people provide really good feedback um, into our deduplicator, which is really good. And then, of course, we always get feedback throughout the year. So I think we have, on a three-month cycle, try to incorporate that feedback in from users. I mean, the good feedback, of course which is 99% of it. Yeah. That's it. So we have help guides as well, helps, but that's pretty much my slides. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. 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 Thanks, Jeff.
Mm. And I wonder um, what would help you build capacity? So, of course, going to conferences, getting a bit of input, uh, talking to experts in the fields. But on top of that, um, what would help building capacity? <laughs> what would help building capacity? <laughs> Um, we have an implementation lead, actually, not me, and she's good at implementation, she's good at teaching, she's good at capacity building strategy, so that's the, that's a big benefit of this year. We have someone who's really good at that. I think we just have to get better at understanding that each of, of our activities require specific skills. You know, people who are good at evaluation, people who are good at teaching, um, people who are good at just reading, reading, figuring out, assessing. Maybe that's just, yeah, skill um, concentration. And I guess time, dedicated time to oh yeah, yeah, roam out and see what's out there, try out things. I think time is a is a is a resource that, in the you know, mm, well, in the production of systematic reviews, often we don't have time. We have to deliver. So I think taking off time to develop capacity—that's something that managers also need to facilitate, right? That's a really good point. Protected time. The core members get 40, 30 to 40 percent officially, maybe, fi maybe up to 50 percent dedicated to the team. And then I argue and I protect that time from their other project leaders when I can. And then I argue back to management that they need, they have to have the space to think. They have to have the space to have meetings with me when I talk this fast and give them lots of assignments. And they need to be able to go back <laughs> and think and do stuff, right? They have, to have, they have to be relaxed enough to be able to learn and to explore something and then to fail, right? I need them to have, be able to have enough time to go and spend six hours looking something up and then report back, no, let's not proceed. And I say, fine, great, thank you. You know, that's the learning part, the learning from failure, right? So yeah, protected time is key, 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 key. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, very interesting. Ooh. So, um, Justin, come into you. Um, All right. <laughs> drawing on your own experience with developing the palette of SRA tools that you just presented, um, how close must IT developers and programmers work together with professionals um, conducting evidence syntheses? I mean, your team seems to be quite close to each other. You, you're saying you're also having lunch together. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, how close must they be and how much of the process and details of systematic review el elaboration must they understand? It's a good question. First of all, I think not as close as we are. You don't have to get that close. I mean, you don't have to be hanging out with each other every weekend like we do. Um, but I think it's, I think it's personally really, really important that you have a strong collaborative relationship uh, between the developers and the reviewers. I, I see quite often, I guess, um, tools that are built where it seems they haven't talked to a reviewer at all, because it's kind of cool, but not quite fit for purpose. So I, I, I think that in all the successful tools I see or hear about or learn about tend to come from groups which do have that very strong collaborative bond, or at least where reviewers are working with developers pretty much side by side at the same place. Um, and there may be some tools which were not done in that environment, I'm not aware of them. Um, so I think that's the really, really important thing. And I think all the best tools or all the good tools come from that very st strong working relationship. You don't have to like them, but you do have to work with them, I guess. So yes, I think it's vitally important. And, and I think that's going to be the way forwards for everyone. Is that a good answer? That was a great answer. And yeah. I would like to um, maybe ask you again, um, so you mentioned that both of um, your team members, um, so one got so much interested in the process of systematic review elaboration that he conducted one himself. Yeah. Um, so how much did they understand at first and how did they learn? Like, did they, were they engaged from, by themselves or did did they have like a run through through the institution to try and understand the processes? Uh, so they came to the workshops first. Uh, so Connor had been working with us for over a year, or I think it might have been almost two years, I think, um, before he actually joined a review team. 
Uh, but they did come to the workshops. Uh, they did hear, listen to me talk about them and rave about them. Uh, they're also in a research institute where systematic reviews are a major part of our research output. So they're kind of surrounded and embedded in, in systematic reviews or evidence synthesis all of the time. Um, it doesn't hurt that Connor's mother is also one of the uh, research people who looks after HDR students, but he kind of got interested, I think he got his first public, I can't remember what his first publication was, it was just a little publication in a, in a small journal, uh, but he loved seeing his name in print so much that he then tried to jump onto lots of different things. Um, and he now, I think, his plans to do a PhD, he's doing his honours year, doing a PhD. Part of that, of course, is always literature reviews and other things. So he just embarked on an academic career, and as part of that, he wanted to learn the skills of systematic reviewing, so it would also make him good at his job, but also for his own career path. And I think that was a key role in that he can see a career future along this pathway, um, until Google offer him five times what we can pay. Of course, but yeah, that's why he just loved the idea of being a researcher as well as a computer scientist, or both combined. So being embedded in the institution really matters a lot to tool development. To our tool development, yes. Uh, I don't want to talk about how other people do it, uh, but yeah, for us, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're seen as a part of the institute. They're not seen as like the, the weird pro... I mean, they are seen as the weird programmers, but weird programmers who are part of the institute. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Lei, coming back to you, um, from your experience at the Norwegian Institute of Public Health, um, at what point in this innovation cycle did you involve um, IT developers? And I think in your presentation you mentioned two. You mentioned on the one hand software developers and on the other hand internal IT and programmers. So where did they come in? Mm. I didn't mention that we are a team of non-specialists, so we're all reviewers. We have, a, we have a team advisor who's a statistician and has machine learning patents, which is mystifying to me, but he's just an advisor. So the people doing the work are, we're completely dependent on software. So we're not developing anything ourselves, so always, software developers have always been kind of the, the bedrock here because that's, that's what we're using, that's what we can use, that's what we're gonna use in the future. And then our IT guy, who I like so much, we loop him in when we just, yeah, for help, for his good ideas, for his input. Um, I think he likes to kind of see if he can compete with the software that we use. Um, yeah, so always. That's, I mean, like Justin is saying, very, very, very close. We wouldn't exist if we, hadn't, if we didn't have software with machine learning functions. Mm -hmm. And um, what worked well in the collaboration with um, your IT programmers and software developers, and where did you reach maybe boundaries of that collaboration? What worked well, I have to just echo what Justin is saying, that the tools are made by people who are reviewers, who know really well what, you know, what, what they're doing and know the process, who are experts in the field. The, the boundaries are that when we teach our researchers, our other reviewers, are we teaching them the software or are we teaching them the machine learning function, mm -hmm. given that we can't? So, so we've tried to separate that. We first have this conceptual teaching. We try not to even mention the software name. And we talk about supervision and unsupervised learning and classification. And then we have a technical, that's kind of our Norwegian language version of potentially a software lesson, potentially. But that's the, then our researchers feel like we, you know, yeah, we'll help them do the scariest thing in the software that they might not want to use. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Oh. Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> um, so, Justin. A survey that was conducted by your institute last year um, of evidence synthesis professionals and their use of automation tools um, indicated that the main or the main barriers for uptake of the tools are first lack of knowledge of existence, two costs, and three a steep learning curve. And I'd like to ask you about the last point. Why do you think? Um, the learning curve is an issue. Are the tools too complicated or are they not user-friendly enough? Or are people afraid of trying out something new? Wow, okay, all three, Maria Inti. <laughs> uh, I've been thinking about that one very, very, uh, quite a bit, actually. And I'm glad that you answered it for me because that will make my life easier. Uh, I honestly think it's a combination of all three. Uh, some tools are quite complicated, but 
to be honest, most are not. I can't think of too many I use or I see. I mean, so for instance, and I won't talk too much about mine, uh, Rayan, for instance, you upload a risk file and start screening. It's very, very simple, easy, intuitive to use. It's a great tool. Uh, the robot search tool we use for screening RCTs, you upload a risk file, strips out some, uh, all the non-RCTs and gives you back a risk file. I mean, so these, it's not actually that hard to use them. I think it's more a matter of uh, people don't seem to be aware of them, and I think people are just don't want to start using them. Because it's always, all these tools are really easy to use the second time you use them. That first time, people just go, oh, I just can't be bothered. I'll do it on my next review. So I actually don't think the tools are that hard to use. I think people are just a little resistant to changing the way they do things, personally. Um, and I, I may be wrong, but um, that was kind of the feeling I got because I was actually quite baffled by that one because all the fam most famous tools around uh, and that have very large user bases are all very intuitive and easy to use. So. And you mentioned you have a person that specializes in this, right? So um, facilitating change. Um, we have a lot of people across the Institute that I call and, and ask for advice. But they're people with business degrees. They're people trained in yeah, change management. So we don't, uh, I just use them as, I use them strategically and try to uh, yeah, extract knowledge from them. Maybe we also need a psychologist in yeah. that team to enable, you know, uh, <laughs> starting with new things. And yeah. I mean, I'm an information specialist, and I have to say that my colleagues, I, most of them, I perceive them to be very interested in new tools. And I think you have to have that intrinsic interest in using a new tool. And if it's that bad that you cannot figure out how it works, people will drop it instantly. But most of the tools that I've been trying out mm -hmm. have been working nicely, or it was possible to contact the people who developed them and they would reply to you. So there's also a responsiveness of the developers involved that I find quite interesting. Yeah. So thank you so far for your inputs. And I would li now like to invite the audience to ask questions. Um, so yeah, please go ahead. Oh, that's me, I with my mic. Question, yes, please. Uh, no, validation, right? Um, what do I think about it? I think it's a huge amount of hard work that's really important to do. Um, but we kind of, we have this idea that building the tools is one thing and validating them are completely different things. Um, if we wait until we validate a tool before we release it, we would release one tool every two years. Um, so although we would love to be able to validate our tools more and more quickly, uh, we don't have the, the person power to do that. So we kind of prioritize releasing tools over then validating them. Um, so, but we, are, we do try. We validated a couple of our tools. I think we did a trial of the Polyglot a little bit while ago. Uh, we've looked at some of our other tools in improving speed and quality um, in a review. And we're now working on our deduplication validation paper as well. Um, but yeah, it's a lot of hard work, and, and it is a, it's an important thing to do. But if you try to validate everything really well every time, I think you'd, we, would, we would have no tools. Um, so trying to get that right. Unless anyone wants to fund huge validation studies and has lots of money, then I'd love to have that money and validate all our tools. It's very difficult to also get funding to do that research, which is also a problem. Uh, just to just to carry on on that one, I think you yes <laughs> you, you need to split up uh, value, uh, validation against what you think 
what's the idea behind the tool and whether or not the tool can do what you think it does and whether or not it fits in your uh, workflow. So the workflow evaluation is, I think, uh, like uh, Liz, is, uh, Liz has been doing in Norway, is looking at your workflow and whether or not it fits in your workflow and is performing what you think it needs to do. And that is a different kind of a validation than like for a deduplication tool, I mean, you've built it, you've tested it on a couple of sets and you think, well, I'm trusting it for my purpose, so it's fine, I'm, I'm going to share it with the rest of the world, but the rest of the world needs to evaluate it within their own workflow whether or not it fits them. So I think those are two different things. No <laughs> Good. Further questions from the audience? Thanks very much for those talks. I enjoyed them both. Justin, this is, I think, for you as well. Sorry. Um, the issue of validation and publication of validation results is interesting because whenever I've worked with engineers, it's like uh, software engineers, they'll say, well, tomorrow it's going to be a different piece of software because it's a <laughs> process of continuing improvement. And I think that's an interesting thing from a group of people who come from let's do it and publish it in static. And have you, you know, how do we deal with that? Because there is the, you'll publish a tool, it's not great, but you might make a change and in three months' time it's fantastic, right? So have you dealt with that and what's your thoughts on that? Uh, really good, great, excellent question. Um, we actually did have that problem with our deduplication validation, uh, which we're still doing. Um, so our first, well, it wasn't our first. Internal testing, we kind of got a, one that was pretty good. And that's what we used as our validation uh, algorithm to use. Um, so then, you know, we did all the testing, blah, blah, blah. So then what do we do with it now? Do we keep it? So and we're now we've used, we've improved the algorithm quite a lot. We have much better ones. So do we keep the old one that's not as good live so people can go back and retest our old results? Because our new results would be much better. It's a really good question. Uh, um, I think we still actually have it available for people if they want, but we do plan on deleting and removing that algorithm so people can no longer use it. Um, but yeah, so it is a problem of do you leave up an old version you know is worse because it happens to also match the validation paper that you validated on. Uh, we're going to take the route of stripping it out and just letting people use the good, best one we can. Which may be the wrong approach, by the way. So if you disagree, let me know. It's very quiet. Hello. Um, yeah, I. I think the, the question on evaluation is really difficult. Um, I, I agree with Justin that it takes time and it's really hard. I think it, not, this isn't your team because you do some great evaluations actually, but there are lots of tools that are just thrown out with no evaluation at the moment. Mm. Um, and I can see why that happens. And I think one of the other challenges is that you need to evaluate for your particular use scenario because we're all working in so many different domains and you can get different performance of these tools in different domains. So there's a question of how generalizable is an evaluation that you see anywhere. Um, I'll turn this into a question in that it's kind of a question for the room that I think that a lot of the early methods, but you know, Cochrane and early systematic reviews came actually from information specialists doing the actual, doing the hard work on that. And I think that's kind of what we need now going forward, that we've got a whole load of tools, a whole load of opportunities, but actually it needs the community now to start to say, okay, so we'll take ownership of these and we're gonna start evaluating them seriously for ourselves and then taking you know, control over when we're going to be using them. Um, I said I was going to turn it into a question. And I think especially for Lee and her work there, I think it's, it's really interesting because what I think you've got is a sort of like an almost knowledge brokering service. It's a little bit like you see going on in public health teams and that kind of thing. But actually you've got a diffusion of innovation there. And I'd be really interested in sort of hearing what you think in terms of how you can take tools but then also think about evaluating them in order to facilitate diffusion of innovation. 
Thanks. I'm trying not to make everything boring for the people who are coming to the workshop at three, because we'll talk a bit. We have a whole we'll have a whole kind of cafe about evaluation. But yeah, we built in evaluation as a trust building activity, but also as a way to provide evidence to our researchers. Look, this tool works or doesn't work. Here's how much here's how much time it saves or not, and then. A, the prior, uh, selection of those that go through evaluation, we then implement further. I forgot your question, James. What was your question? I'm sorry. <laughs> what was the role of evaluation in... Yeah, the role of evaluation, yeah. We, I mean, why would we change current practice? We would change it if it's faster or if it performs better and if people accept it. Maybe not accept it more, but at least accept it. So that's what we have to prove with an evaluation before we even try to teach ourselves or teach each other or teach other researchers. So our evaluations are used strategically to collect that data and then make the decision if we're going to go forward or not. Um, and it's used, and, and those outcomes are to build trust. So those outcomes are picked both pragmatically but also strategically. And we also, maybe there's a role, or a bigger role for people like us who are non-specialists because we can just give data sets and we do to software. We have a couple of collaborations with software providers where we give data sets and we say, please use these and use them to make your tool better. And I'm like, happy to do that, right? Happy, happy. So. Maybe that's an interesting, maybe it's a whole other technique. Um, using our, yeah. Um, to that directly? Your outcomes, oh, sorry. Uh, your outcomes might not be the same as the outcomes as some other people would like to know. So I think it's very good if you share data sets that is, it's shared with a lot of um, information around it so that we know what your perspective was of doing the evaluation because your evaluation, maybe you have lowered the threshold because within your institution that's good enough uh, while someone else from a different perspective uh, really needs uh, to amp it up uh, the quality of whatsoever. So I think that's really important. That's also what I just meant with the evaluation. So you need to do it within your own uh, workflow. Um, Sif. Do yes. you want to ask the last question? Yes, should I ask my question or should I ask uh, people during the break? <laughs> well, actually, we are almost out of time, so if you would rather ask them during the break, yeah. uh, I, can <laughs> I can wrap up now. So, um, thank you a lot for your inputs, for sharing your experiences with us. I think that has been very valuable. And um, I think we could go on discussing for another hour at least. And please do take the chance to speak to our speakers, to your colleagues during breaks. Um, it's so good to see all of you again in person. Please enjoy the meeting today and tomorrow. And I wish you a fruitful exchange with your colleagues. Thank you to our speakers. Mm -hmm.